the first thing when we lose someone who is close to us and we are upset and sad, the first thing really to remember is that they haven't vanished. What happens at death is that consciousness, the mind, is losing the control of the physical elements that constitute this body. This is actually a continuous process. You can notice that. You can describe you know, the process of aging that consciousness is less and less able to organize and control these physical elements. For example, heat element. You may have noticed, and I'm old enough now that I notice I'm more sensitive to both heat and cold. Uh, heat regulation is just uh, less efficient. Consciousness uh, can't manage the heat element quite as well anymore like when we were really young. And of course when people are dying uh, you can see that this will become much more erratic. You know, they may get a high fever, they may feel very cold. Now, water element when we get older, sometimes skin becomes very dry. Can't manage you know, the uh, moisture, humidity there. Or you know, the eyes may start dripping, or even saliva out of the mouth when people get very old and once they are starting to die. Now, this is the uh, water element. And we start you know, losing control over that. And then the you know, earth element. You can notice it you know, like with the bones, that is you know, the hardest and the most earthy, strongest emphasis on the earth element and the human body. And they're usually mixed, you know, these four physical elements, Maha, Tatu, you know, they're usually mixed in certain proportions, earth, water, heat and you know, wind. Wind isn't necessarily uh, literally wind, but uh, just the flow of energy in the body. But the bones uh, have a very high proportion of earth element. And I think looking around, there's probably quite a few who are old enough that you notice that your earth element in the bones is no longer like when you were 20, isn't it? I notice it when I'm walking. When you're young, walking is just so easy and it's just like dung, dung, dung. And I'm walking now, it's more like boop, boop, boop. <laughs> and it takes effort suddenly. When I was really young, it didn't feel it takes any effort. And even walking an hour is just like enjoyable. You don't feel you have to put forth any effort. Whereas now, you feel it requires a certain amount of deliberate effort and the flexibility weakening and then of course now the wind element that is usually in almost the definition at least the old traditional definition of death now when the last breath goes out this is a more subtle element and one's consciousness and can't even connect and control or remain tied you know, to the most subtle of these four elements that is usually you know, when, when death occurs in you know, the last breath. So it's good to contemplate, you know, first of all, when we lose someone, what we really have lost is you know, the physical body constituted by these four elements. What we haven't really lost is a more important part, which is the mind. Now, what we usually appreciate most in a person we love is uh, qualities you know, which are not in the body but in the mind. Now, that is one difference between true love and just sensual infatuation. The sensual infatuation may be only interested in the physical body. It doesn't last long. But if we uh, truly appreciate someone, and it is usually the mental quality, their kindness, their generosity, their virtue, their knowledge, their intelligence, 
uh, dedication in looking after family, their responsibility in executing uh, their duties, you know, their understanding in particular of the Dhamma, uh, their calmness, you know, all these kind of things is what we truly appreciate and that is not really lost. What death can destroy is only these physical elements and someone's kindness or someone's knowledge, understanding of the Dhamma and so on. No, this is not in any of the physical elements, it's in the mind. Of course, the sad thing is now that we can't have no communication anymore. Although the consciousness, the mind is still around, we are usually no longer in a position to directly communicate. However, those with psychic powers they can do that. Now, this is why the Buddha was only a little bit puzzled when King Pasenadi once asked him, uh, about uh, what, what happens after death or whether, whether there are devas and spirits uh, for someone like the Buddha you know, who sees them just like he sees you know, human beings and for anyone with this psychic power you know, death is something completely different there's one psychic power that comes from samadhi which is called the Dibba Chaku uh, the Buddha developed that on the night of his summer on Bodhi while meditating under the Bodhi tree. And that means that you, when you develop that power, you can see beings passing away, the consciousness, mind separating from the physical body, then moving around, looking for a new rebirth, and then connecting to a new body and a new life. And they can see that literally. And the simile the Buddha gave is like if you are standing on a high building, maybe a Brisbane City Hall. Have you been up there? You can walk up ne, to the clock tower there. And then you have, what is a big square? I don't really go there often as a monk. The, the big square in front is a George Square. King George, King George Square. Ne? So imagine you're up on the clock tower and then you're looking onto King George Square and you can see people coming out from one of the houses or the shops. What is the big shops there? Do you know what that is? Is there a Mayas close by? Yeah. So you can see people coming out in one of the boutiques or the shops and they go over King George Square and they go into another building. This is how the Buddha describes it, if someone has got that psychic power. And then they obviously and they wouldn't think anymore that death is just annihilation or nothing. Now, if you don't have that psychic power, and if you can still rely on the Buddha here, who has you know, taught that and always been completely unambiguous about the fact of uh, rebirth and the efficacy of karma. However, the, just the fact that it continues doesn't mean everything is good and easy uh, because our karma will kick in. And if we have made bad karma by hurting and harming other beings, uh, by breaking precepts, by being stingy and egoistic, then that, that karma and that mental inclination that kind of desire and tendencies that we have developed that will drag us to a bad rebirth, pulling us down. On the other hand, if we have made good karma, we have been helping others, we have been kind and compassionate, and that is how I remember uh, Tilak, now that karma will pull us up to a rebirth even as a deva, or a human rebirth, which can be sometimes even more helpful you know, for Dhamma development if it's in a good environment. Unfortunately, it also means we can help with that you know, by sharing good karma, just what you did today. Making some powerful act of good karma in the name of that person 
in a meeting with a whole family and then dedicating it to that person. Even if someone was very good in this life, and if you never know, there may be still some residual bad karma from previous lives, and even lifetimes ago, which may come up, so you can never have too much good karma. That's the basics there. It's a little bit... Anyone here having problems with having too much money? Is that something you struggle with? Or oh, just too muchness is enough now, and I don't want more money. You would don't mind having another thousand, ten thousand, a million even. And I think even the billionaires, it seems, they wouldn't mind having more. But karma is even more important. Money can actually be quite harmful. Look at what sometimes happens you know, to the kids of very rich people. It can be quite destructive you know, to grow up you know, with so much money and power. But uh, good karma has no bad side effects. So it's always good to maximize good karma and it's always good to share good karma even with a good person when they have passed away. You can't go wrong there. Now maybe Tilak is already reborn as a deva or even as a human. What happens with your good karma then? Because it's particularly effective uh, for the Peter world when they're reborn in the spirit world, and what they call hungry ghosts, because they completely depend on relatives and other kind people sharing karma with them. But usually we hope that it doesn't happen to a loved one, it's one of the unfortunate rebirth. And someone who practices the Dhamma has faith in the Buddha, keeps precepts, and is generous, and they. Uh, should usually come back you know, as a human being or as a deva. Do you know what happens with your shared karma? Is it wasted then? Now, the Buddha said the Peter world is never empty of relatives. So some other relatives can come in then. Now, this is why we often use, like in Sri Lanka, you use the uh, plural formula. Idang me nyati nang hotu. So gita hontu nyata yo. The Pali is plural. Nyata yo is a plural. Nyati nang is a dative plural. So even if you have mostly tilak in mind, you open your mind also to share with other past relatives. If you're really kind, you may even be willing to share with non-relatives. Some peters can receive that. The simile I give for that one is usually a birthday cake. If you have got the birthday and someone bakes a nice big birthday cake for you and offers that to you, do you eat it all alone? Usually not. It may be bad for your cholesterol level and your diabetes and so on. Usually it's shared around with others. And even when we offer that birthday cake, we know that already it's mostly meant for the birthday boy or birthday girl, but we know that it will be shared with others as well. This is a good attitude when you share merits. Like today, you mostly dedicate that primarily first to Tilak, but you have in your mind that uh, you may not even need that. And then the other past relatives can come in. And why can you be so sure that there will be other relatives? Because the lifespan there is very, very long. There can be hundreds, thousands, millions and millions of years in human reckoning. And we had relatives not only in this life, we also had mother and father and brother and sister and maybe children and uncles and aunties and cousins and so on in your last human birth. Even in an animal rebirth, we usually have relatives. And we had so many past lives. And sometimes because 
the human life is comparatively short compared to the spirits and petals, some relative who was close to you, close family member, a hundred lifetimes ago, if they then uh, passed away and were reborn in the Peter world, they may very be still there. You may have lived a hundred lifetimes as a human, but because the lifespan is so much shorter as a human than for the spirits, that person may still be there. And they may even be still feeling some connection. That sometimes happened to Ajahn Man, the monk, from your perspective on the left of the Buddha, from my perspective, the right. And he had these psychic powers and he could see patterns and spirits and devas. And it happened that he was approached by a hungry ghost and uh, he would ask Ajahn Man whether he could find the relatives that they could make good karma on his behalf. And he explained to Ajahn Man what village, what family. But uh, sometimes Ajahn Man tried to actually do something there and try to trace it. And he realized you know, that uh, this ghost must be talking about you know, the remote past. There were no villages like that. You know, everything was totally different by now. So he couldn't help them. He couldn't find these relatives. So it's a really important duty, and the one duty the Buddha pointed out for particular children, because we can never know whether someone is reborn. However, if Tilak is maybe reborn as a deva, already enjoying himself in Nandana Grove of Tusita Heaven, is all endowed with the divine strands of enjoyment, Have you ever sent some donation or some charity to Bill Gates personally? Or maybe Jeff Bezos? Like, like sometimes they have these charity collection, uh, old clothes. Would that be a nice idea, sending a bag of old clothes to Jeff Bezos in case he needs some? No one does it, no? why not? Uh, or Bill, uh, Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk, I think, is now considered the richest, according to the official lists. Some people say that to be really rich means that you can afford not to be on these lists. But <laughs> anyway, if you wouldn't want to, we want to send it to Elon Musk. It doesn't make sense. These people are so rich. They're so similar. There's no real need. And if someone is born in a beautiful Deva Loka, they wouldn't depend on all merit sharing. But they would still be happy if they happen to know what you're doing. This is also an important aspect of merit sharing. Just put yourself into the position of the departed. Imagine you are the one who has passed away. And now you may be aware, which you can be, the spirits can easily, for example, mind read. It's a normal communication there. They can easily go wherever they want to go. It's just like thinking. You can think of Sri Lanka and your mind is white in Sri Lanka. In the spirit world, when they think about that place, they will be right there. So the spirits may well be present if that's possible. Of course, if the departed is already reborn as a human, he will not present. Just like you wouldn't even know and if some past relative of you is currently sharing merits with you, but now you're already reborn as a human, you wouldn't even know that's happening. But the spirits now may be present and they may be able to read what you're thinking and how you're feeling. And when they know that the whole family is coming together in their name, and remembering them with gratitude and kindness and that they make the effort of making good karma and sharing that, that they also feel very, very happy. You can imagine how you would feel yourself. You're not forgotten. The whole family, even beyond your death, coming together and sharing with you. And that happiness will also get you to a better rebirth.
Because for the spirits, the moment their mind is happy, the moment their mind changes, even their body and the environment can change. It's much more subtle. So when they experience great joy, that may boost them up to a higher level of rebirth straight away. So that's another really important aspect of sharing merits. However, if they are present and they see that you're really upset and really sad and that you're really depressed and that you feel you don't even want to live anymore because you miss the departed so much, just imagine you were the departed and you see your loved one in that kind of depression and deep sadness. How would you feel? You would be upset, no? That's exactly the situation for the spirit of the departed. And this is one reason that the Buddha always encourages us to contemplate wisely about impermanence and that uh, no life can last forever, that these four elements will fall apart, that whatever has come into being will also end and cease so that we can let go. Because if we can let go and come out of our sadness and our grief, that is also the best service for the departed. If you die, would you want your children to be depressed for years? Isn't, no, no. You would want them to remember you, but you would want them to still be happy and successful and live their life joyfully and successfully. That's usually the same for everyone. So when we contemplate uh, impermanence, uh, what has come to be and it will fall apart again, what has been born must die. Anything that arises due to causes and conditions will end when these causes and conditions uh, come to an end. If we contemplate like that, the heart can let go. And that is obviously better for us, because if the heart lets go, we are coming out of our sadness and our grief. But it's also better for the departed, because the departed wouldn't want us to be depressed and sad. And one really important point, and the letting go doesn't mean forgetting. There's different kinds of letting go. The one can let go out of carelessness. Now, for example, uh, someone dies you don't even know, and you just don't bother. It's very easy, isn't it? I mean, every day in the average, I think it's about 150,000 people dying on planet Earth every day in the average. But it doesn't make you particularly upset or depressed because we just don't bother, we don't even know them. This is completely different from letting go based on wisdom and insight. So if you let go of a dear departed, it doesn't mean that you don't care about them or that you forget about them. The best example for that is the Buddha himself. The, the moment the Buddha attained Sama Sambodhi, supreme awakening under the Bodhi tree, meditating, he had zero attachment, zero craving, zero clinging to any of his relatives, nothing. But did he forget them? What did he do? Hmm? Do you know what he did? No, he went back. After he had started the sasana and had a big sangha, because he knew his father as a king, if he just comes there on his own, they will not respect him so highly. But if he comes, as he did, after he had become the most famous 
and respected spiritual teacher in all of India, and he had a huge Sangha of very outstanding disciples who would travel with him and uh, treat him as their guru, their teacher. It's obviously much more impressive and has an easier job in teaching uh, uh, the very proud Sakyans and the king. That's our donkey, or the neighbor's donkey. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, uh, donkey call is quite distinct. Yeah. They're actually quite amazing. Now, sometimes they can use them to protect sheep because a donkey really fights back. And even if a wolf come and uh, other animals, a donkey is really a fighter. They will be quite careful and they're stubborn. So if you have a few donkeys with your sheep, they will protect the sheep. <laughs> this may be a warning call for any dangerous animals. So the Buddha went back after he had the Sangha and he was an outstanding teacher and he was extremely successful. So not only did he not forget his relatives, but it turned out that he was of greater benefit, of greater use for the relatives after he had abandoned attachment. I notice many people have this instinctual kind of fear that really practicing and contemplating and really letting go, I better shouldn't do that because I might be a bad grandmother or a bad child or a bad father. If I have no attachment to the children because we can usually only think about letting go of attachment in this worldly way, like not caring, like people I don't know anyhow. There's nothing completely different. So you don't have to worry. You're an even better mother. You're a better child if you really could let go of all attachment. And you can see that as the example of the Buddha. Because after the Buddha went back, he didn't forget his family. He had zero attachment, zero clinging, zero desire. But he still had compassion. He still had loving kindness. He still had gratitude. He still had respect to those who deserve respect. Now, these are things which are not eliminated when you become enlightened. This is only the kilesas who go. An enlightened person is not like a zombie. They have emotions, but only the good and wholesome ones. So they have no central desire, they have no anger, they have no conceit, they have no infatuation, passion, all these things, the hatred, that is all gone. But their compassion, their loving kindness, their gratitude, that even reaches the highest possible level. This is more than an unenlightened person with attachment. And because of that, they can help their relatives as well as other beings even more effectively, even more beneficially. So don't think there's something wrong and once you let go, you're not really looking after the kids or grandkids well anymore. It's the opposite. The Buddha had no attachment to his little child, Vahula. But when he went back, he even got him ordained and he continued training him for years. And at age 20, he attained Nibbana, near the end of our suffering. He overcame death, near the highest happiness. His son got that. His ex-wife became a nun, also attained full enlightenment, total freedom from death, highest happiness. One of the chief uh, non-disciples of the Buddha his half-brother, the same, became a monk, enlightenment. His stepmother, looking after him, since his mother passed away a week after his birth, became the first bhikkhuni, enlightened one of the chief non-disciples of the Buddha. His father, they say, on the deathbed, became an abahant before a stream enter. 
as a mother he taught in Tusita heaven and at least dream entry. And so many, all the close relatives basically, Abahans, and so many of the wider relatives and joint family in a, a ordaining, becoming stream enters. This is what the Buddha could do without any attachment. Could any of you do that to your family with all the attachment you have? I see. Don't worry about letting go. You'll be a better mother. You'll be a better person for everyone. You don't have to be afraid of letting go. If it is letting go based on wisdom, not on carelessness and ingratitude, or I don't bother, but if it's based on wisdom and insight, it will actually further actualize you know, all these good qualities. Lung Po Tongdang, when he was here, and we asked about that, because I... At one occasion when we had an outing, I, f I felt I could physically feel you know, his matter. I was so strong. I could, could feel it even in my legs, you know, like some tingling or something. You know, really amazing. It feels so good. And I asked him you know, whether uh, someone who has abandoned defilements or you know, very strongly reduced them, uh, whether they have a you know, stronger matter. And then he, he said yes. The different form that he would distinguish that between uh, upper manya and Brahma Vihaba, which may not be the canonical usage, no, but uh, he feels that no, someone who is free from delusion and craving, no, there's a different level of loving kindness. It's truly upper manya, it's truly boundless, limitless. So it will be even better for everyone. Or don't be afraid letting go and coming out of sadness. doesn't mean that you forget or that you're not helping anymore. You'll be even more efficient and beneficial in your efforts in helping loved ones as well as all beings. But it's also a good occasion to contemplate that we will follow Tilak quite a few people here, and there's probably 30 people. And how many of these 30 people here are not going to die? Is there any? You're not going to die. How are you doing that? Amazing. I'm not sure on that one. I'm sorry that I may have bad news for you, but I have a feeling every single of these 30 people in here will die one day. I'm afraid we have no choice on that. I certainly wish all of you that this is a long, long time into the future. May you live 100 years, 120 years, even longer. But no, even 120 years, which is about the oldest you can find in the Guinness Book and so on, with good documentation. No, this is not forever, isn't it? So I'm afraid of the reality which we have to face, that every single person you see, everyone here, everyone else, not here, and one day we have to die. And you can notice, no, if you practice meditation, mindfulness of the body, in particular, the ones among us a bit older and how the things are already changing and how consciousness is already no longer having quite the grip on it like when you were young. So the trick is that you have abandoned attachment to these four elements before they fall apart on you because it will be much, much easier. Imagine you're going out at night in the valley, maybe out there on the weekend, and uh, three o'clock in the morning you're around in some uh, little street, no one around. And suddenly you know, a few heavy boys or bikies are coming up to you, pulling out a gun or a knife and asking you for your purse. Do you think it's a good idea to hold on to the purse? 
And people may have different views on that, but I probably would give it to the people because my life would be more important to me. Because if, if you don't give it, they may just attack you and then they get it in the end anyhow. But in this situation, then maybe you have a chance and you may be even stronger or someone still saves you or they let go. But with the body, you know, that these elements will go one day anyhow. One day we have to let go of that anyhow. So much smarter to let go already before it happens. But then the process will be easy. And when you let go of these four elements, the earth, water, heat and wind, you will not be reborn in the body anymore. That would be the third stage of enlightenment if you can fully let go of the physical elements. You would go to a non-material realm, the Sutta Vasa, and from there you would attain Nibbana. The problem of rebirth, at least in a physical body, would be fully resolved and then after, for sure, after some more time, you will attain full freedom from any rebirth. So it's a very good contemplation. Uh, looking how these elements are changing. They're quite, off control, quite out of control. One simple example I often give. Can you please take a really deep breath in? Really deep. And now you keep it. Your breath, wind element, keeping it. Hold on to it, don't give it away. Does that work? Can you keep that breath? Will you be able to keep that? Your breath is in your body. This is your breath. Why don't you keep it? If you try to keep it, if you're really determined, you don't want to let go of that air, of that breath, what does it feel like? After a minute, trying to hold on to that breath, what does it feel like? Pleasant? Very painful, eh? And even if you're determined and you endure the pain, you're so attached to that breath, to that wind element, that you try to keep it and you endure the pain, Will you be able to keep it? No. You have to let go anyhow, isn't it? And if you try to keep the breath, and now I'm complaining, I'm in pain, I can't take it anymore. What would you tell me? Let go. What does it feel like when you finally let go? <sighs> Feels so good, isn't it? Do you think there's a teaching in that? Could one maybe say this is showing, the wind element is showing you that holding on is painful and letting go is the end of pain? Is maybe the wind element teaching you that you can't hold on however much you try and that is only painful? What do you think? Is that a reasonable statement? Maybe you think this is only the wind element, but the water element is different. Water element, I mean. My water in my body is not mine. I keep this water forever. Is that a valid claim? Can I do that? Can I stop sweating? Can you do that? Can you just determine I don't sweat anymore? I don't evaporate any water? Or you drink a lot? Maybe I drink the whole bottle? 
And then I try to keep that water. What will that feel like? If you drink a few liters of water and then you try to keep it forever, will that feel pleasant? Will you be able to do it? You have to let go of that water. And that feels so good. Ne? Have you ever been urgently having to go to the toilet and then finally you make it? Uh, yeah. So the wind element, the water element, it's all teaching us all the time. So obvious, isn't it? How many times do you breathe in and out in one day? Can't keep it. How much water is going in and out of your body all the time? How much heat element is going in and out of your body all the time? Now it's getting too hot again and we put on aircon. Can you remember in winter how you probably complained? It's so cold and the cold wind. And why didn't you keep the cold? You couldn't. And so we have to let go of these four elements. And once the mind lets go of that, then you're not going to get reborn because your consciousness wouldn't latch onto that anymore. 